be seated. The meeting is being audio recorded, so you may laugh, but don't make any errant commentary. <sighs> Let mutual love continue. This is, I'm rereading something that Lily read so perfectly that I just want to remember it by restating it. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's only being audio recorded. You can come on in. It's really okay. <laughs> it's okay, whatever. So, humility and hospitality is what the readings are sort of about today. Not a bad thing to have for a sermon. Those are two pillars of the Christian faith, among others, humility and hospitality. I think that they are two of the primary pillars and goals that we as Canterburyans strive for, being humble yet hospitable. Those goals, those two virtues of humility and hospitality, well, they were front and center at three events around IU campus and in downtown Bloomington recently, but they were not front and center in the way you might have hoped. I'm talking about three events, Culture Fest, Student Involvement Fair, and Pride Fest. All of these in Bloomington 2022. Now this is a real question, not simply a rhetorical question. Actually, let this one be a rhetorical, we'll ask some real ones later. What might these three events, Culture Fest, Student Involvement Fair, Pride Fest, what might those three events have in common? Well, yes, I was there. And they are fests, and they are for students, and they are for the people of Bloomington. But among many other commonalities, these three in particular, this particular year, each of them had an unfortunate thread that ran through them. At each of these gatherings, Canterbury House, we were present, we were front and center. We were there to witness, unfortunately, the opposite of humility by some. We were there to witness, unfortunately, the opposite of hospitality by some. As it turns out, for several weeks now, between preaching here at Canterbury and preaching at Trinity, I've had the fortune, or the challenge, to preach on a topic that I do hold very dear. That topic is this, how do we as a church, capital C, how do we acknowledge and address conflict, especially in these times in our culture where conflict is the new connection? How do we deal with it? And we find it everywhere we go, bidden or unbidden, conflict exists. So, yes, I've had the privilege and the challenge of preaching on it for several weeks now. Trust me, there are people who put me through my paces when I said, you have to love your enemies, and they said, yes, but how exactly do you plan for me to do that? Exactly is the operative term, and that's not easy to answer. But how do you and I reconcile being ministers of the gospel? And I said we because you are also ministers of the gospel. Don't let this fool you. You minister more broadly and widely than do I. How do we reconcile being ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where the message, our message, is to this world that our God so loves the world that God gave God's only begotten Son that you and I and all of us might have abundant life? So that's our message. How do we embody that when there is real hurt and there's real harm coming from people inside the church, going out from the church, hurt, hurt and harm out into the world that God loves so much? How do we embody that love that God has for the world? There's so much hurt coming from the church. I mean, after all, a question you could ask is, is there an appropriate way to somehow value another human being as a child of God while confronting them, maybe even confronting them in a full-on in-person confrontation? 
I've had two of those in these three events this week. I had to stop Lily from getting into a third. Do we have to be kind in order to love others the way we think God asks us to? I mean, really, is there a Christian way to confront without being confrontational? Is there a Christian way to confront without seeking conflict just for the sake of conflict? Even though three times this past week I've seen Christians seeking conflict simply for the sake of conflict. I've come to realize anew that the moment of confrontation is not the right moment to ask these deeper, more esoteric, philosophical questions, how to be a Christian without being confrontational while preventing harm. The moment of confrontation is not the moment to ask yourself those questions. Because in that moment, that moment where I'm still hyper vigilant and I'm keyed up and I've been in the presence of, or I've been in confrontation with a bully, a Christian bully, that moment when I'm so angry about the way they're twisting the gospel that I love so much and using it to harm people who I love, particularly in this case, people who identify as LGBTQIA or some other form of queer. Maybe that's not the moment that I'm best suited to ask myself about the intricacies of dealing with injustice or in hospitality in others. I mean, at that very moment, at least in my case this past week, I'm employing the same anti-values that the bully is presenting with because I'm telling protesters in a loud, clear voice while I'm physically in their space that they are not welcome here. I'm doing exactly what they're doing but I hope that I, I tell myself I'm doing it for a better cause. I'm trying to keep third parties who are vulnerable from being harmed. But even still, I'm bullying the bully. You probably know this, but I've known this ever since early on in my social work days. You and I go into survival mode. We get what's called lizard brain. That's probably the real medical term for it, lizard brain. And in lizard brain, my mind is set to fight or flight, black or white, wrong or right. Lizard brain is not the right frame of mind to reflect on the deep spiritual values of hospitality and humility. Truly deep loving of others, by which I do not mean mushy sentiment. It calls for thinking and praying and meditation especially with the unlovable and the unlikable and the mean. Loving our enemies is a long game strategy and it has very little to do with the moment of confrontation. I have an analogy for this. And I think it's brilliant. If I'm in the process of saving people from burning buildings, okay, buildings are on fire, I'm running in, I'm getting them out. That is not the time to reflect on how to identify best or arrest arsonists. That is not the time for me to be thinking about what's the right approach to addressing electrical wiring in old buildings across town as a matter of municipal policy. Those are important questions, but at that moment, I need to only do what I'm trained to do, to fight back flames and pull people out and give them medical attention. Now this doesn't mean I have a bad public policy opinion on what multi-unit dwellings should be made of to make them flame retardant. It just means that in the moment it's not the time to think about what's best in the long run. It also doesn't mean I'm a bad arson investigator that because I'm simply rescuing people instead of trying to catch the arsonist, doesn't mean I'm giving too much grace to these people who are causing harm who need to be stopped. Fighting fire and pulling people out means I'm attending to the matter at hand. And the matter at hand is there is a fire in a home or there is a bully in the street causing harm to people who need no such harm caused to them. 
This matter at hand is spontaneous, and it is just like fire, unpredictable, and it is relatively uncontrollable. I'm there to reduce or prevent harm only. Dealing with a bully in the midst of his or her bullying is dealing with the matter at hand. I take comfort that Jesus always deals with the matter at hand, what we might call the, the short game. You see it today, he admonishes religious leaders. He offers actual healing in the moment that someone's hurting. All of this while he's in the midst of a religious house fire. It is when he leaves the scene, it's when he leaves us, it's after the fact, it's after the confrontation or the conflict that he leaves us with words to pray through over the course of our coming days about how, about how you and I find our truest and holiest path to our own humility and to hospitality, to building the world around us as God would have us to do. Our conflicts did not arise in a single day. Finding true peace, true humility, finding the truest way of entertaining angels unawares, it takes 10 times as long to put into effect. After all, loving our enemies goes against the grain of the way the world around us works. It always takes longer to build than it does to tear down. This is true of buildings, this is true of nations, and it is true of bullying. It is true of people's hearts and souls. They can be torn down more quickly and it takes longer to build them back up, but that's our long-term goal. God, give us courage for the short-term and patience and guidance and prayer for the long-term that your true healing may be found in our humility and our hospitality. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>